Attention, attention, all personnel. Incoming podcast. This is MASH Matters. Over and out. Welcome back to MASH Matters. We're here talking MASH all the time. I'm Ryan Patrick, and he's Jeff Maxwell. Hello, Jeff. Hello, Ryan Patrick. I am Jeff Maxwell. I am, and I'm still Jeff Maxwell. And I'm going <laughs> to be Jeff Maxwell until the cows come home. Ooh. Mm. I can hear them now. Yeah. They're coming home. <laughs> uh, so today we have a very special guest with us, Elizabeth Alda Ohaney. If that one name in there sounds familiar, it's because, yeah, she's related to that Alan Alda fella. In fact, Elizabeth is Alan's daughter. And you, Jeff, go back quite a ways with Elizabeth. I do. All the way back to uh, stage nine at 20th Century Fox when uh, MASH was in production. Alan would show up, obviously, because he worked there. <laughs> His two, well, he has three daughters. Two of them were quite prominent on the set. It was Elizabeth and Beatrice. We used to hang out because there was, you know, sometimes there's nothing to do and you're hanging out and you're kind of bored. And so uh, I met the two of them and they were very fun, very bright, interesting young women. And we had a good time and we became friends and we had a great time being on the set. And you hadn't talked to or seen her since then, right? Since then. Absolutely not. Until today. Until today. Day. And she was quite nice to reach out to us and say, hey, I listened to your podcast and it's really cool. And I said, well, Elizabeth, come on the podcast. And she said, yes. Yes, she did. And here it is, our conversation with Elizabeth. I wish I could see you. I guess I didn't realize that this technology didn't allow me to see you. Uh, right. We could have done Zoom, right. which we could have seen each other. But sometimes, you know, normally Ryan and I don't use Zoom. We don't yeah. use the video portion of it. It's all audio. Well, then you can't see that I put on lipstick and everything for you guys. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have too. I don't know about Ryan. I have. <laughs> I, we all have. No, that's you know, Jamie right? Farr's job is to put on the lipstick. <laughs> right. That's part I do remember. <laughs> All right. I don't know if Ryan knows this about me, Jeff. Did you share with him what a terrible memory I have? Uh, no, I have not yet. No. It'll be a really short podcast. It's going to be the shortest podcast in history. <laughs> you know, I, I, I have to say, this is a real thrill for me uh, because you and I have not spoken to each other in approximately 47, 46, something like that years. Right. It's been that length of time. And yet I would recognize you in a heartbeat when I hear your voice and how you're talking. Oh, isn't that interesting? Yeah. I, I mean, same is true of you. I feel that way too. I mean, I was 13 when MASH first began. That was the pilot show was when I was 13 years old. And then when it ended in 1982, I was a senior in college. So it really formed a lot of who I am in terms of what I what I remember about that time. My dad was flying back and forth um, from yes. the East Coast to the West Coast, West Coast to the East Coast. He was flying the red eye every single weekend so that they didn't have to uproot us. And we had, you know, because we were in high school. Mm -hmm. So they had a long discussion about, sh you know, what should we do? And they didn't think MASH was going to succeed. So <laughs> they were like, well, let, let's not uproot the family because it may only go one season. So, you know, once that one season went and it was clear that it was a success, they, you know, then made the, the ultimate decision to keep us on the East Coast and have his life be on the West Coast. But he flew home every weekend. Mm -hmm. So it and then in summers and school vacations, we were all out in L.A. Mm -hmm. So it really I mean, from the time I was 13 all the way through till the end of college, MASH was, you know, a thing. So it was very informative for me. And it was, and I have very clear memories of certain things. Mm -hmm. I have very little memory of certain other things. But um, I think the things that I remember are the things that really kind of shaped me a little bit. And, you know, I'm forever grateful to my parents for not uprooting us and having us live on the West Coast. I just feel like I, I would have been a very different person had that happened. Why would you? have been different what would what would have been different about you well i mean you know it's hard to say not knowing you know the grass is always greener kind of thing i i have a lot of friends who did grow up there and you know and they went to certain schools that like the kids of celebrities go to and i just think it was we were more grounded i think live we grew up in new jersey in a very very tiny town in new jersey called leonia and i feel like it kept us grounded mm-hmm 
And at that point in our lives, it would have been very difficult, I think, for myself and my two sisters to be raised in the environment that was L.A. at that time. You know, and my friends that grew up in L.A., they're wonderful people now. I'm still friendly with some of them now. But it was a very, very different thing. And it was a different time. I mean, it was the 70s into the early 80s. It was a different time than it is now. Well, I I remember meeting you and your sister. I don't know your older sister. I don't know her, but I remember meeting you and and Beatrice. Yeah, I was thinking about that today, Jeff. I don't know why you don't know Eve. Yeah, I Because the I don't... three of us are very, very close in age. My sister B, Beatrice, um, who's uh, only 11 months younger than I am. So, And then I'm the middle. And then my older sister Eve is only 18 months older than I am. But she, all the way through her high school life, she had a very different childhood than we did. But I'm trying to remember, she would have been with us in LA. I don't know why. She didn't hang out at the set yeah. as much much as you and I did. Yeah. Yeah. Well, meeting you and Beatrice was a, a really fun thing for me because, you know, people think it's very glamorous to be on a television show and do right. all that shooting. And, and it can be. I mean, it's, right. a, it's an electric place and it's very stimulating. And you're working with very intelligent, stimulating people. On the other hand, it can be really dull. There are very, and, very, very long periods. Long periods. So if you're not in a scene and yeah. they're working on thing and they're setting up the other shots, you have to sit around and try and figure out what to do with yourself so you don't fall asleep or go nuts. Right. Now, meeting you... Help me do that. Uh, <laughs> Help me not I go mean, nuts. My mem- All right, how, I hate to out you, but how much older uh, than me are you, Jeff? Like four hundred years, <laughs> approximately. In my mind, you were you were very much older than I was, but I don't think in reality, I don't think that's true. Uh, you were much younger than I was, right? But. I was a pretty young, you know, I was a kid. I still am a kid. And I liked to play. And you guys were ready to play. But what was McLean Stevenson's reason for playing with us? McLean Stevenson was so much fun on the set. He was so playful. And so so was Gary Berghoff. I mean, they all, Loretta Swit, I remember going to her trailer. And I remember her being appalled that my sister B and I didn't know who Tyrone Patrick Powers was. She said to my dad, Alan, how could you have raised your children not knowing the classic movies? And he was like, I, I don't know. And so he don't had know. us into her trailer like weekly and we would watch the old classic movies. I, I can hear Loretta's voice saying that. Yes. <laughs> was, I mean, she, I, she's still to this day. I mean, my dad and she are in close touch and she's very, I haven't spoken with her since those days, but I clearly remember that. She she took kind of like a parental role with us, and I mean everybody kind of took us under their wing in their own way. But Jeff, yeah, I do remember you and B and I used to goof around on the set. McLean used yes. to goof around with us, yes. and Gary, of course, used to be playful with us. But then, of course, there was a lot of time on the set where you know my dad and the major characters and you, to some extent, were learning lines and trying, you know, because it's a lot of dead time where you're waiting, 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 and then it's like, oh my god, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up, we're losing the light. And then you right. have to like scramble. We're and- losing the light <laughs> and money. Hurry. <laughs> So I do remember, I do remember having so much fun on the set. I do too. And and I remember uh, your humor and uh, the idea we'd roam around trying to find vending machines to see what we could find. <laughs> oh my, I remember craft service on that set. Do your listeners know what craft service is? Probably, right? That's where you get all your, your neat stuff, your coffee and your donuts and all that stuff. Right. Yeah. I mean, that was my first experience, I think, with craft service. So that to me, of course, when you're a kid, a teenager, you're like, oh my God, like all this free food. <laughs> I mean, it's all junk food and all, you know, you could buy it at the local, you know, five and dime, but it was fun for us. But also I do have to say, I have such a heavy heart when I think about Kelly Nakahara. Oh yeah. She and you both, you know, like took us under your wings and were playful with us. And Kelly had such an amazing sense of humor and her laughter to this day. I, I hear her in my head sometimes. I just, yeah. I just adored her. And I was in touch with her a little bit in recent years, but we never got together. Mm-hmm. I was so sorry to hear about her passing, but she was also like part of the gang. Like we had, yeah, we had, and I'm sure, you know, there were other people on the set that 
that I knew, but I didn't know that well. But they, you know, those people would remember me, but I just don't remember, you know, all of your cronies, like the people that you, you know, were your age that were hanging out on set and stuff. Well, well some of them are incarcerated now, so it's better that you didn't know that. I mean, may I, although that could have been a good life lesson. I don't know. <laughs> I might have learned some stuff. I'm just kidding about that. They're not really in charge. Well, not too many of them anyway. I do remember uh, my dad telling us, my dad has always been impressed with young people that do amazing things with their lives. So there was one, and I cannot remember her name now. Who was the um, the woman, the extra I think she was an extra. She might have had a small speaking role, but she created that hamburger place. Oh, yes. Gwen Adair. Gwen. Yeah. Yes. So I remember him telling us, like, you know, one of the um, actors on the show, like, she created this amazing, like, hamburger stand, and it's really popular, and it's still around. It's still around. Yeah. Was yeah. it? Which one was it? Fat Burger. It was Fat Burger. Okay. I thought it was. Now, she, she didn't actually create it. Her mother created it. Oh, interesting. And it was on La Cienega in in Los Angeles, yes. and she created the hamburger uh, store, the ha- hamburger concept of Fat Burger. Wow! And then Gwen obviously eventually took it over right. and ended up selling it, the whole chain. Wow! Uh, but Gwen is a remarkable. She was terrific. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. I yeah. feel bad that I don't remember her specifically. I remember hearing about her, but I don't think I remember. I don't think I had much of a relationship with her. I just know, mm-hmm. you know, he told me the story about her. But yeah, interesting. Interesting. Also, she. Uh, for a time, she was a boxing referee. Yeah. Yeah. One of the first female referees who adjudicated a uh, title fight. So that was a big deal. Wow. So was a, she was pretty cool. Ryan, jump in any time. <laughs> Ryan's so quiet. Ryan, you say know, something. I'm just listening to two old friends catch up. It's great. I love it. It's super fun. Okay. My first question is when people find out who your dad is, what is the question that you hear the most? <laughs> oh, I think Jeff could probably answer that. But I thought your first question was going to be, did you take your Xanax today? Because- <laughs> That's my follow-up. That's my follow-up That's question. The second yes. question. We, we do a medication segment later in the episode. Got it. Just go through all um, the medications that we're on. Right, right, exactly. So, okay, the number one question that people ask me is, what was it like growing up with a famous father? Mm-hmm. And then what do you think my answer is? I won't, I, I don't go there. I'll let you say that okay. answer. I'm not and sure. The answer is always... It's all I know. Mm-hmm. There's a, I don't have any way to compare. So, mm-hmm. I mean, I had an awesome childhood. I had two amazing parents. Mm-hmm. I almost always bring in my mom into the answer because my mom yeah, is the most amazing woman I think that I've ever met. And I mean, a lot of people know about her because she's successful in her own right. She started out, my parents actually met when my mom was a classical musician. She played clarinet for the Houston Symphony when they met. Hmm. So she played professional clarinet and she also plays piano she's just turned 90 last spring and she still plays piano she still takes piano lessons which is Mm. like incredible so yeah she's an amazing woman and she's also a photographer so her subsequent career after she sort of retired from being a professional musician she ended up being when we were little she felt like she needed a creative outlet so she started taking photographs and she's a professional photographer so over the years oh I'm not even going to attempt to figure out how many, I should know this, how many books that she has published where her photography, she did a lot of um, children's books. She authored a lot of children's books where she did the text and also did the photographs. And then after a while, she ended up just doing the writing for them and she had illustrators doing the illustrations. So she has many, many, many uh, children's books that are out there. Her name is Arlene Alda and she is a fantastic woman. And my parents, (laughs) when when people ask my parents, what's the secret to a long marriage? They've been married a very long time at this point. They got married when my dad was, I think, 20 or 21. And my mom is three years older than he is. And when people ask them, what's the secret to a long marriage? My mom says a short memory. So <laughs> <laughs> I think that's very useful. That's a, that's a great answer. <laughs> short memory. 
funny. I know that your mom and your dad both collaborated on a book about MASH too. Yeah. She took photographs during the finale. That's right. The last days of MASH. And it's it's great. Her photographs and his words. It's it's a, it's a great, great book. I think uh, somebody told me it was out of print, I think, but I, you might be able to find it on if your listeners wanted to look at it. It, it might be available on some used book websites. Yeah. But it's yeah. really a phenomenal. The photographs are amazing and it goes all the way through sort of the genesis of making the series all the way through to the final episode, which was really a tearjerker. Tearjerker for those watching, but also tearjerker for those of us involved. I remember being there on set for the filming of the final episode. It was, Mm. yeah, it was intense. So were you a fan of the show since it was part of your home life you know and you were a teenager at the time yeah i mean i i was it's interesting you know what's so interesting is when i i think that i do remember okay so this is gonna date me and you too jeff um and you too probably ryan but i'm from a generation where we literally had three networks we had NBC, ABC, and CBS. Yep. And that's all we had. We had the little rabbit ears on the TV. And then eventually, <laughs> I know. Those little rabbit ears. I miss those little <laughs> rabbit ears. They never worked very well either. You could never get them to work right. Yeah, you would get like all the fuzz and like, yeah. you would try to arrange it so like you could get a clear signal and that kind of thing. And then, <laughs> so I remember, oh God, I'll probably get this wrong, but I think, was it Monday night or Tuesday night on CBS? MASH came on. Do you remember? Remember, Jeff? Ryan's the expert. So it, was, well, it bounced around throughout the years. I think it landed on Monday nights. Okay. That's why my memory is e- was either Monday or Tuesday. Yeah. I think you're right. Because I think it started on Tuesday, but then bounced to Monday, maybe. They did move it around a little bit, but not a ton. Not like shows are moved around nowadays. Right. So the, I do remember that. And I remember, you know, watching the show. I do remember watching it weekly. I did watch it weekly. And of course, I was a big fan because it was a big deal. I mean, it, we were living a very humble life in Leonia, New Jersey. And like my dad was on this like major hit TV show. It was and I, you know, my B and I, my sister Beatrice and I went to a private school uh, high school. Eve went to a public high school in our town. But, you know, it was a big deal because, like, my dad was on national TV and it wasn't like today where there's all the social media and everything like that. It was really like, because because people only got three channels, it was kind of a big deal if the relative was on one of them. Right, right, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, so I do remember being a fan, but it's interesting because when I graduated from college in 1982, I did move out to LA to try to my hand at acting, to try to be an actress. Oh. And I ultimately ended up leaving the field and, and doing something and going into the field of education. But I remember, like, I remember leaving college and being excited to go to LA and try my hand at acting. But the interesting thing is when I was growing up on the set of MASH, I didn't have, I don't remember having those aspirations. Hmm. Like, it's not like I ever was like, ooh, you know, dad. I And I say to him now, I'm like, you know what I my biggest regret is, is that I didn't go in and observe the writer's room. Or do you remember Karen Hall? Yes. Yeah. Sure. So I'm still friendly with her on Facebook. And she was straight out of college. She was a writer on the show. And I sometimes now think, because I love to write and I love that process. And I sometimes now wish that I had said to him, could I sit in on the writer's room and see what that process is like? I think I maybe only did it once or twice out of curiosity, but I wish I had learned that from being on the set Mm -hmm. there were you know when you're a kid there you're stupid like you don't think i mean what did we do on the 20th century fox lot we went to different studios to see what was filming we tried to like break in and like see what what, what, the films were like Like, you go buy a soda you know stupid things like you ride your bike around the lot and like you could see famous people you go to the commissary the cafeteria and you try to see famous people buying their lunch like that was stupid (laughs) why didn't i do something useful with my time i don't know well what you did was helping me not be bored so thank you very much (laughs) or or you were helping me be a delinquent one of the oh that could be too i'm sorry well what the heck Mm, wow 
Wow, <laughs> that's a, that's interesting. Yeah, you might have been very engaged with the writing process and and watching them and how that worked. Maybe, yeah. I mean, maybe mm-hmm. I wasn't interested in it at that time, like, or maybe I don't know what what I was thinking at the time. But mm-hmm. it's it, that's probably why I ended up leaving the whole profession because I don't feel like I had that kind of grit that you need to stay in that business. Mm-hmm. I felt it when I went on auditions. I didn't feel like I had the stick to it. I felt if somebody said something negative to me, I was like, oh, yeah, you're probably right. And I, would like, I would like go home and just be sad about it. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I feel like you have to have a certain chutzpah. To, you know what that word means? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. For anybody that doesn't, they can look it up. Okay. Google it. Yeah. <laughs> Try spelling that one. So you, have to, you have to have a certain amount of chutzpah to like be in the business and stick in the business, stay with it. Because, you know, for me, I think I was talented. Like, I think I had a natural talent. I was in, uh, my dad wrote a movie called The Four Seasons that I was in. I played his daughter and Carol Burnett's daughter. He was married to Carol Burnett uh-huh. in the movie. And I played their daughter. And my sister Beatrice actually played Len Carew's daughter and Sandy Dennis's daughter in the movie. <laughs> um, and then after we did the movie, a lot of people don't know this. After we did the movie, my dad and a wonderful writer named Don Siegel, who has since passed away the two of them wrote the television version of the four seasons and i was in that and i i actually had a bigger part in that than i had because i then i was out of college we filmed the movie when i was in college and so i had to take a few months off but um we did the television series after i graduated college and that was super fun Hmm. and then i did like piecemeal i would get like little things but I don't know. After doing it for about eight or 10 years, I just felt like I wasn't really getting anywhere. And I really didn't have that hunger for it. I just didn't have it. Mm -hmm. So I went into education and I'm much happier and I'm still in education. I'm much happier doing that. How did you make that transition? How did you say, hey, I'm going into education? Okay. So when I, okay. So (laughs) I learned because I have a terrible memory, as we've established. <laughs> I learned this by reading my dad, one of my dad's books that came out a bunch of years ago. I think it was in the book, Never Have Your Dog Stuffed. Mm-hmm. I, I read about it in his book about how I made the transition. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. I don't remember that. But he's absolutely right. That is how it happened. So when I was in college, I did a um, like year abroad mm-hmm. work, you know, schooling or whatever, like junior year abroad or whatever. But instead of that, I did my sophomore year, I did it at the National Theater Institute was based in Connecticut at the time. And it was this really intense, like semester of theater and stage design and sound design and lighting design and like every part of the theater. And so I petitioned my school actually to be able to do that. And when I did that semester, the National Theater of the Deaf was actually based there. They're now based in Washington, D.C., but at the time they were based on the same campus as my theater school. So I became really good friends with some of the deaf actors and actresses, and I learned sign language. I started learning sign language from them just because I had some downtime, I guess. I don't know. And I started like hanging with them and just out and they all just signed in ASL in American Sign Language the entire time they didn't as my recollection is they didn't really use their voices so I was kind of forced to like learn the language so I learned sign language there and then when I was in LA after I graduated college and was acting in LA I kind of felt like I wanted to do something else so I was like volunteering at a preschool for little deaf kids and stuff like that Mm. and I started to realize like I really really enjoyed it it gave me creative enjoyment more than the acting was giving me Mm -hmm. so I decided you know what I'm just gonna LA actually turns out uh, I was living in the Valley in Tarzana at the time. And in um, Northridge, there's a fabulous school where they um, award graduate degrees in deaf education, uh, Cal State Northridge. I ended up applying there and getting in and doing that program for three years and just loving it. Because I figured, you know, what do I have to lose? Like, I'll try it. If I don't like it, I can always go back to acting or do something else. But I felt like, you know, if this is as good as it seems like it's going to be, then I'll I'll stick with that. So I did. I stayed in that program for a few years. Then I came back to the East Coast. And then many years later, recently, actually, about three or four years ago, I ended up getting my doctorate in education. Wow. So I actually have a doctorate. I'm a literacy coach at a school for the deaf right now. What a great journey to have gone through the show business thing and the act 
acting thing. And then suddenly you find something that is so meaningful to you and touches your heart and your soul. Yeah. And it is just, you know, you can't get enough of it and you crave it and you're really, really good at it because it's it's who you are. It's who I am. And, it's, and it is my great passion in life. Yeah. And when my daughter mm-hmm. was born, so my ex-husband and I was married for about 25 years and then we ended up getting divorced. We're still close and good friends because we have a daughter together. But we ended up adopting our daughter when she was a newborn in Las Vegas. And as she started developing, we started realizing there were things about her development that were not on track and turns out that she has very severe dyslexia. So then I started like taking a leave from the deaf education world and dove headfirst into dyslexia and what they call language-based learning disabilities. That's what dyslexia is. It's actually a disability that affects your entire language processing center of the brain. And it's interesting because when people say to me, like, why did you end up focusing on that instead of deafness? I say to them, it's really interesting. To me, it's very, very similar. Like when my daughter was little, she would act like she was using an interpreter. It takes her that long to process spoken information. And and now she's 24. And she told me the other day that like so many people say to her, you look like you don't want to be here. Why is that? And she goes, it's not that I don't want to be here. I'm trying to figure out what you're saying. Like, So it's really like now that she's, and she, I'm so proud of her. Like she graduated from college last spring bring magna cum laude mm. the sex a kid like the statistics don't support that she even would have gone to college so i'm super proud of her i mean you can imagine you know her mom's an educator so i you know but i gave her many times i gave her an out you don't have to finish you could take a break and she stuck with it and she was like no i i need to do this for myself Good for her but anyway so i did take a little detour into like the world of dyslexia and that kind of thing which so those are my two passions is learning disabilities and deaf education. Well, good for you. Boy, oh boy. Good for you. That's wonderful. Thank you. Elizabeth, when you decided early on before education to pursue acting, did your dad support that? Did he try to talk you out of it initially? Or what was his take on that? Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, when people ask him that question, did you support them or not? I think he used to say something like, I'll get his words wrong, but he used to say something like, I would discourage them as much as I could, but then support them as much as I could. So he really felt, I think he felt like it's such a tough field Mm -hmm. that he didn't want our hearts to be broken every time we would go on an audition. And yet he, of course, wanted to be a supportive parent. So he would support us every chance he could. But he did let us know that it's it's tough. It's tough to do. And it's interesting because now my sister Eve, my older sister, her oldest son, his name is Scott Alda Coffey. He's actually an actor in LA now. So my dad is now like in that next generation, like trying to support him and help him. But, you know, it's tough. It's a tough field. And then, you know, the young actors today with the pandemic hitting, Mm. I mean, Scott was in a movie that came out literally was supposed to come out in theaters literally as the pandemic hit and it went straight to um, streaming service. Mm -hmm. I mean, it did very well even on streaming, but it was unfortunate. It was a big disappointment because it was an amazing movie that didn't see, I don't think it ever went into a theater. Mm. What was the film that he was in? Outpost, The Outpost. It was out in 2019. Did you guys read the book? No. No. The Outpost was written by um, Topper, Tapper, Jake. Oh, Jake Tapper. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the Jake Tapper that's on CNN? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Here's a fun little uh, story. He has actually retweeted some of our stuff. Oh, really? So I don't know if Jake Tapper listens to this podcast. He might be a listener. Mm-hmm. Maybe he listens to you because he likes the topic or maybe, I don't maybe know. He's a MASH fan, yeah. Yeah, that's very cool. Wow. Well, so Jake, hey, baby, if you're listening, uh, <laughs> you know, hit us up. We'd love to talk to you. I didn't have a movie for Scott. Yeah, that too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I am fascinated by the story that you told earlier, and it's a story that I was aware of, of your dad flying back on weekends during the run of the show. Yeah. I'm curious, on your end, in New Jersey, at home, yeah. was it hard not having him around? Was it hard on your mom? She's raising you know, three kids without him being there? Yeah, I think about that sometimes now that I'm older. I think about that it must have been very difficult for her. But uh, you know, at the time, she didn't let on that it was. Mm. I mean, we were in high school, so we were very busy. I mean, of course, we missed him, but we were busy with our high school lives. Mm. 
but I can imagine that it was very lonely and not great for my mom, mm-hmm. you know, having to be that distance apart. But they, he also flew home every time he flew home. I mean, he was permanently jet lagged mm-hmm. because he would fly home on the red eye, the night flight on Friday night. So he would wrap up filming on Friday, run to the airport, get on the plane, get to New Jersey the next morning because of the time difference. He wouldn't arrive until early morning on Saturday. And then he would do the same thing in reverse on Sunday night. Mm. And because of the time difference, he would gain time. But in reality, it was the middle of the night when he got there. So it was very hard for him. And when he would come home, I imagine that it probably, this probably wasn't the case as we got older. But in the first few years, it was important to him to have one-on-one time with each of us. So he would, he probably maybe even talked about this when you guys had him on. I don't remember if he mentioned this, but he would ask each of us when it was our turn for our day with him, where do you want to go? And (laughs) we all, there was this tiny little amusement park, like 10 minutes, 15 minutes from our house called Palisades Amusement Park. (laughs) B and I especially loved it there. So when it was our turn to go out with him, we would always say, we want to go to Palisades Amusement Park. (laughs) And he did it. (laughs) He went every single time. I mean, he basically would spend, he would fly all that way and then spend his entire weekend at Palisades Amusement Park. (laughs) (laughs) You know, one of the things uh, that impressed me so much about him, obviously, he's a brilliant actor and writer and director and an incredibly talented human being. He truly is. Yeah. But one of the things that really, really impressed me about Alan Alda was his stamina. Yeah. And I think you're talking to that uh, because I knew that he was flying back and forth. And I would see him come in and spend, you know, Monday through Friday and then go back to New Jersey right. and then come back and then do Monday through Friday and never never lose a beat you know he never he never wandered in like he was exhausted or anything always there 120% amazing right exactly and also remember he was also sometimes writing and directing those episodes right Exactly. And I honestly, I think I inherited his energy from him because (laughs) I mean, both my parents are incredibly energetic. My dad is now 87. My mom's 90. And they're both still working. My dad does his podcast, Clear and Vivid. All of your listeners should be listening to it. Mm -hmm. (laughs) It's it's an amazing podcast. So he does that. He's like nonstop working. Mm -hmm. And my mom is always working on some project. She's either writing a book or she's collaborating. Collaborating. Both of them are involved in a lot of creative endeavors. They do book clubs. They have a good group of friends where they live out on Long Island in New York. And they sometimes do cooking things. And my parents entertain all the time. My mom and dad, both of them cook. And so they, you know, entertain uh, for, you know, just for their friends for small dinner parties and whatnot. They're both incredibly energetic. But yeah, my dad has always been that like little energizer bunny. I don't know how he did it all those years. But- I- I don't either. I mean, the yeah, not only the stamina and the energy to give, the, right. even if you didn't fly back and forth anywhere, just doing a television series like that in his position Monday through Friday for all those years right. is exhausting. Right. That ain't easy to do <laughs> and to show yeah. up with the acting chops and the ability to bring that character life every single day, it's it was an amazing thing to watch. It really was. Yeah, wow. Thank you. Yeah, that's a, it, it was amazing. But that's probably also why if you look in that in the book that you mentioned earlier, what was the book called? After MASH or something? I think it's called The Last Days of MASH. The Last Days of MASH, right. So if you look in that book, there are several photos, I believe, of him napping on the set. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> You'll have to go back and look and see if you can yeah. find those photos. Yeah. But he, yeah, he was amazing. I give him a lot of credit. I don't know how he did that. I wish I had maybe 4% of that. Right. Now. I know. I <laughs> know. Yeah. It's true. Amazing. I want to kind of talk about MASH for a second. As you say, it was an important moment in your life, obviously, because you were Alan's daughter and you were dealing with what was going on, but you were also dealing with the artistic elements of the television show. And you were kind of a kid back then, but you were watching the show. And now as an adult, can you look back on it and kind of get why everybody 50 years later, in a few days, it's going to be 51 years later, right. uh, people are still so impacted by it and affected by it. And uh, Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. I, I mean, honestly... 
you know, it was the first of its kind to not use a laugh track. Well, I'm sure you guys have talked about this frequently that there, you know, sitcom, what we call sitcom situation comedies back then, they all had an audience. And even if, even with the audience, they had canned laughter, I guess, to let the audience know when they were supposed to laugh, right. <laughs> which is so bizarre concept to me. But MASH was the first of its kind that was nowadays we would probably term it a dramedy. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm not really sure that it technically it fit the terms of a sitcom. I don't know. And it was filmed like a movie would be. It wasn't filmed like a three camera sitcom. So I think that the audience, you know, the audience was very sophisticated and they continue to be very sophisticated. You know, generations now down the line are getting hooked on it. And I think it's because of that. I think that people recognize the quality of the show. The writing was incredible. The directing was incredible. The acting was incredible. You know, I I think that it resonated with that generation that went through that war and it resonated with, you know, generations down the line and people that had nothing to do, you know, didn't know anything about the war. So I think for those reasons, it still continues to hook people. I mean, even myself, I still watch reruns once in a while and I, I'm hooked all over again. I don't know. I, I, I mean, for me, it, it resonates differently for me because it sometimes reminds me, oh my God, I remember after that scene was filmed, Jeff and I did this or McLean and I did this or, you know, so that for me, it resonates it's like that. Mm-hmm. Elizabeth, the world knows your dad as a beloved actor, a writer, a director, a lover of science, yeah. a great communicator. But is there something that we don't know about your dad? <laughs> <laughs> we'll not know about Alan Alda. That might surprise us. Oh, interesting <laughs> question. That might surprise you. I don't know. I mean, he's, you know, he is a very private person, as you all know. But even though he is that private person, the public pretty much know, like, what you see is what you get. Yeah. So, you know, even though he doesn't like, he, when we were growing up, he wanted our lives to have some degree of privacy and not let the paparazzi in too much. You know, when, when we were photographed, it was very controlled by him and by my mom. Yeah. But even having said that, I'm not sure there's anything that the public doesn't know about him. I mean, he's incredibly funny. I'm pretty much what people see is who he is. I mean, he's incredibly compassionate. You know, he has Parkinson's now, but he's doing very well. Because of his love and interest in science, he actually caught it very early on because he, you know, he reads tons of science magazines. I think people know about that. That's why he got interested in science because when he was very much younger, he would read scientific... I'm sorry. Can I let my dog out for a second? Sure. Sorry. <laughs> Otherwise, we'll be right back after Elizabeth <laughs> let her dog out. <laughs> All right. Here we are back again. Okay. That, so he would read Scientific American Frontiers magazine. And then he ended up hosting science show almost by the same name, Scientific American, or Fr- I forget what they called it. But they, it, anyway, he ended up hosting that because of his interest in science. But because he always read those science articles, he recognized early on the very, very, very early signs of Parkinson's. And he went to his doctor and and got all the testing done. And it was so early that he didn't even have tremors yet. Mm. And so he's very lucky that they got on it right away and he's doing really well. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I don't, you know, honestly, I can't think of anything. I was trying to get some good dirt. I know, I don't have any good dirt. (laughs) I don't have any good, like, family, deep, dark secrets. Uh. Okay. I don't know. I know. It's disappointing. I'm sorry. Well, thanks for talking to us. <laughs> That's the end of the interview. <laughs> this is how my memory works. Typically, like three days from now, I'll be like, oh, I should have answered the question that way. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like such a slow processor, so I'll let you know. <laughs> Send us the dirt in an envelope, a plain brown unmarked envelope. Right, exactly. Yeah. Well, he is uh, certainly, uh, you know, I spent nine years there. And uh, in those nine years, I really gained a tremendous respect for everybody there. I don't, I'm not just going to focus on Alan because he's a terrific, brilliant actor. But everybody there had their own genius to them. Oh, absolutely. And so it was a very st- Stimulating environment. Yeah. Golly, gee willikers. Well, I am so impressed. With what? That you're not in show business. 
<laughs> I, I'm so impressed that you're doing such wonderful work with people. I mean, yeah. that's really, yeah. I mean, honest to God, you're helping people and, and dealing with their own issues and helping them navigate it and walk through it and grow. I don't know what could be more exciting than doing that. I, I really congratulate you for doing that. Thanks. That's, yeah, I really do love it. And you can hear that when you talk about it, you can really hear it. Am I Crazy, Ryan, do you, did you hear that? I mean, is she really just darn excited about it? Yes, you are crazy, but she is also <laughs> darn excited about it. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing I, I failed to mention, the other thing that I actually, and it's completely like almost op, well, not really completely opposite, but it's a little bit like taking a detour off of that career path. The other thing that I started doing re more recently in the last four years or so is I love doing, I'm telling you guys because you're podcasters, I love doing podcast research. Oh. And I, I don't know. I think when I earned my doctorate, I realized what I loved about getting my doctorate was the research and writing part of it. Mm. So I actually, for the last few years, once in a while, when my dad is swamped and needs some help, I actually do research for him for the, his podcast. Huh. And it's like a very nerdy thing to enjoy, but I love doing research. <laughs> I don't know. It's weird. Oh, that's great. Like, how do you guys do it? Like, do you just rely on Jeff's memory? Because that seems like a dicey, <laughs> like a dicey thing. That's, that's a frightening thought. <laughs> that's kind of a frightening thought. Like, yeah. how do you guys do it? Like, Ryan, how do you, how did you get interested and how how did like you must have at some point done a bunch of research? Well, I've been a lifelong fan of the show. Okay. And so I've just always been drawn to any information I could get about the show because I had a deep love for it. Yeah. So my interest and in my research comes out of me just loving the show. That's great. That said, we get questions from listeners that I have no idea what the answer is. Oh, interesting. So then you'll go into a deep dive to try to find it. Yeah. I'll ask my good friend Google yeah. if they know. Exactly. Right. Then we go deeper and we're able to sometimes reach out to some people who are involved with the show who may know. Right. Or I find I when I listen to your podcast, which I do quite often, I do a lot of driving. So I'm always listening to a podcast. Oh, you're the one. OK. <laughs> I, was yeah, Darn, I wish I'd have said that. Oh, no, no, no. listeners, that's me repeatedly. <laughs> <laughs> Run around but, the room, make it look like a crowd. All right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> but I do. I do think. Think that other listeners to your podcast probably know the answers. I mean, there are some major, mm -hmm. yeah. major fans of MASH that oh, remember yeah. all of the episodes and can recite mm -hmm. lines and stuff. My dad can't even do that. Mm -hmm. That's probably, well, I don't know. Did that come up when you guys interviewed him? That might be a deep, dark secret. If you ask him right now about a specific episode, he'll probably say, I don't remember it. Right. Even <laughs> if it's one that he wrote, he doesn't remember them. Yeah. Well, it was a while ago. Yeah, it, was. <laughs> it really was a while ago. I remember all my 14 lines, so that's good. <laughs> Elizabeth, this has been great. Thank oh, you. so great to talk to you guys. Oh. I really it makes me want to be with you. But now let me get this straight. Jeff, are you in LA? Where are you? I am in Los Angeles, California. Okay. And Ryan, you're not. Where are you? I am in the southern tip of Illinois. Illinois. Southern tip. Okay. I'm terrible with geography. Yeah, me too. Is that anywhere near Chicago? No, we're at the complete other end of the state. Other end of the state. Okay. But that was impressive. Yeah. I know where Chicago is. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> That's how bad my geography is. And you point to Kansas on the map. Kansas. It's somewhere in the middle of the country. Okay. So uh, you guys are never physically in the same place. Well, you are sometimes, right? Didn't you do Tampa together? And didn't you do like some of the, the mash? You went to the ranch and stuff together, didn't you? Right. Yeah. We did a convention together that was in Indianapolis. Okay. And then also last year on the 50th anniversary of the pilot episode, Jeff and I were lucky to join listeners out at the shooting location at the ranch. Wow. You know, that was like literally this weekend a year ago. Yep. Do you know how I know that? Because my nephew, Scott, who I was talking about earlier, got mm -hmm. married in LA this weekend. So I knew that you guys were there and I was really trying to figure out how I could come surprise you. Oh, that would have yeah. been great. Oh, how and fun. So, but I couldn't been. because it was like the wedding was like in the middle of the weekend and there were all these wedding things going on. So I just couldn't get away. But you're not going to believe, well, when I tell you, you're going to be kicking me or kicking you. I don't know. But the wedding was in the Malibu Hills. Oh, so really? we were literally, I mean, I was probably 20 minutes from you guys. Oh, darn. I know. I really thought about it though. So I 
I get points for that, right? Oh, you get points. A lot of points. That would have been really fun. That would have been a joy. Wow. Next time. Next time. Absolutely. Yeah, at the 100th. At the 100th. We'll all be there at the 100th. I think we better shoot for 55. I'm not sure we're going to be around for the 100th. (laughs) Thank you guys so much for having me on. This was such a treat for me. Uh, Absolute special treat for me. I cannot tell you how much. It was so wonderful to talk to you after 47 or whatever, how many years. Don't make it that many more years, Jeff. No, don't make it. Yeah. And I I remember when your dad was on the podcast, I did say to him that we, uh, I used to enjoy you guys so much on the set and we had a great time. And he's, oh, I didn't know that. Oh, that's great. Well, he knew it at the time. He just didn't remember it. He didn't remember (laughs) it. Uh-oh. Although he might've been so jet lagged that he didn't remember it. Boy, yeah. Wow. Well, Elizabeth, thank you for sharing time with us and thank you to your mother and your sisters and to you for sharing your father with us. We appreciate it. Oh, (laughs) thank you so much, you guys. Great to talk to you. Oh, Elizabeth, that was, was that fun or what, Ryan? Wasn't that great? I love it. You know, of course, I love talking to anybody who has any part of the history of MASH, but to get an intimate glimpse into not only his life, but also their home life. I'm still amazed by that story that he would fly back every weekend. Yeah. Yeah. So I appreciated everything that she had to tell us, even though she didn't really give us any good dirt on him, you know, but I'm still waiting. Well, maybe maybe we can get her to do a part two and she'll bring on the dirt with her. I doubt she look she was great fun back then and she was great fun uh, on this podcast yeah I really appreciate her being here and thank you Elizabeth for doing this and uh, hey come back anytime our podcast is your podcast as long as you bring dirt (laughs) (laughs) yes thank you Elizabeth and also thank you to our Patreon VIPs we want to uh, send out a salute to Private Michael Berkey and Private Samantha Lawrence Corporal Brian Hackwith Corporal Gray Greg Barnett. Promoted from private, by the way. Thank you, Corporal Greg. Captain Liza Winter Ng. And Major Heath Daniels. Also promoted from Captain. That's pretty big, yeah. Big leap. Thank you to everybody who supports the show on Patreon. You too can add your name to the list by going to mashmatters.com slash support. Our next episode, we're going to be talking about your book, Jeff, and uh, talking to a gentleman who was very instrumental in reviving the book. Yep. We thank Mr. Arthur Healy for showing up, and he's going to be a great guest. And uh, he's very responsible for reviving Secrets of the Mash, Master Lost Recipes of Private Igor. And fear not. That season seven recap is on the horizon. No. Really? Really. Is it coming? It's coming. I promise you. In fact, we will be putting out a social media post asking for people's favorite episodes. If you're not on social media, this is your call right now. What's your favorite season seven episode? And tell us why it's your favorite episode. You can email us, mashmatterspodcast at gmail.com. Or if you want to call us and tell us what your favorite episode from season seven is, you can do that under three minutes in length at 513-436-4077. And because it is under three minutes in length, you can actually recreate some of my lines from your favorite episode (laughs) in season seven. Feel free. Until next time, here's looking up your old address.